waste of time. Uh, I've got better things to do. And uh, he does. He'd just gone, come back from you know, Japan. He'd been travelling around the world. And he said, better to spend your time promoting altruism. And um, that was what he thinks is the secret to happiness and a better life, is infinite altruism. So the next time that I met him, um, I was interviewing him for the Sunday night program. And I asked him about this idea of infinite altruism because it was a theme that had come up um, during his visit. And... Uh, it was interesting. Again, he just didn't want to give the answers that we were all expecting. He said, ah, you don't learn it from Buddhism. No. And you don't learn it from um, meditating, you reckon. Sorry, Tim and Gary. But um, he said, you, you learn it from your mum. He said, I learned it from my mum. He said, everyone can learn it because everyone's got a mum. He said, the problem is, is that there are a lot of angry people in the world. And he confessed to being a very angry person himself. And then he giggled because <laughs> that is kind of funny. Um, and uh, he said... He said the only way to get around it, he, he said, is through um, practical applied ethics, uh, religion, philosophy and using our brains, applying ourselves, getting out there and doing stuff. And I, I, I asked him, so doing, not sitting, and he said, absolutely. Um, and I think the message, I don't know whether he's trying to make Westerners feel better about the fact that they're crap at meditating, as I am, or whether he's trying to get people out of the lotus position and actually engaged in life and doing things as he does. Either way, I thought they were genius answers. Okay, there we go. That's my bike in Byron, that I, the photo I took on the weekend. Um, in fact, I think that was meant to go in the gratitude section. So if you can just imagine that that was in the gratitude section, because I'm grateful for my bike and, uh, and that vista, really. Um, but, you know, it's a nice backdrop to the next point. Um, so a, a while back, I had been contacted by a few people and they'd mentioned Brene Brown. I don't know how many people here have heard of her, um, but... She's, I think her lecture at, at, on TED.com is one of the most popular lectures. Um, and I have this theory, when three things happen, you know, I, I, when three things happen, I strike. I do something about it. And in fact, it's how I met Tim. Three people have mentioned Tim to me and I went, oh, God, I'm going to have to go and learn to meditate. <laughs> <laughs> and I went kicking and screaming, didn't I? Um, so three times in a week, thought I'd better contact this woman and sure enough, she was having her first visit the following week to Australia, to Sydney as it happened. So we caught up for a cup of tea and I like this anecdote because it's something I do. She is a scientist and she studied wholeheartedness, what made, pe made people wholehearted for eight years. And then she had a breakdown because she realised that she wasn't wholehearted. She wasn't authentic. She was an absolute fraud. And she threw it all away, <laughs> something I'd do, and um, went into therapy for 12 months as I guess somebody from California would do. Anyway, she came out the other end and she felt that what wholehearted people had in common was vulnerability and that's what she'd been missing. And, um, you know, she was a very clinical, scientific kind of person and so she knew that she had to work on this. And she also, from all her eight years of studying wholehearted, vulnerable people, worked out that um, vulnerability came about when you were deliberate. And um, I find this really interesting. I like the idea of deliberateness. And she gave me two tips. Um, she has a red flag. She says that when she starts asking other people their opinion on a big decision she's got to make, that's her red flag. Because it means that she's gripping at certainty. She's wanting to be certain. Um, and when this happens, she stops and she, she gives in to the vulnerability of being uncertain. And from there, from that horrible, irky space, um, she'll find her, her best decision. Um, her green flag is discomfort, which is quite similar, I suppose. But when she feels antsy and when something's just annoying her, she knows that it's the right thing that she needs to be doing. Um, she reminds herself that this is supposed to be uncomfortable. It means something is growing. Um, so I asked her for some examples of that, and she sort of gave some really good ones. She said, saying, I love you first... Uh, doing something with no guarantees and investing in a relationship that might not work. And she said, when you can go there and sit in the uncomfortableness of it and be deliberate about it, it flexes the wholehearted muscle. Um, and I guess at the time I remember I'd bad-mouthed somebody and um, it was really annoying me and I knew I could get away with it because I had some rational, um, cerebral, very convincing um, way 
of um, of proving, you know, of, of of trying to get out of it basically. And um, I thought, you know, I'm going to try this irky discomfort feeling that Brene was talking about. So I sat in it and it was terrible. And I just wanted to go and use all my words, you know, to get myself out of it and to rationalise it. Um, in the end, I confessed to this person what had happened and um, I saw it as going out on the limb, you know, sort of furthest from the trunk, standing on the furthest limbs and I was blowing out in the breeze. And what was quite incredible is the person came back and said, I know, it's okay, I can see, um, I can see that you, you know, I can see that you know you're wrong and I can see that you're sorry. Um, and I guess I got in that moment this notion of vulnerability and I think it is about going out to the most exposed outer limb um, and, you know, being blown about a bit but then being seen. But, you know, when you're close to the trunk covered by all the leaves, you don't get seen as well. And personally, um, that's kind of almost my mantra for life is, is going out onto the furthest limb because what's, what's the point? We're given 85, 90 years on this life, on this planet, and I think um, a lot of action happens on the outer limbs. Okay. Oops. There's me wearing flat shoes next to a very short man. <laughs> um, uh, this is a nice one. Do the right thing and the rest follows. And I noticed this come up a lot. This was a pattern that people who are successful don't necessarily talk about because they don't even see it necessarily in themselves. Um, but this is Mitch Album. And uh, who's, who's read Tuesdays with Mori? Yeah, a lot of people. Um, it's um, the most popular or the most bought or most successful memoir in history. And um, I sort of had to say to him, you know, like it, I read it years ago and I had to say to him, look, I don't mean to be rude, but how on earth did you think that a memoir, a story about some sports hack from the Midwest that nobody had heard of, writing a, a story about his high school teacher who was dying would kind of cut it, you know? Um, it just seems like, why would you put so much effort? And at the time I was writing a book, why would you put so much effort into a story kind of that, you know, and indeed the publishers, he went through 12 publishers, all of whom turned it down. It took him quite some time to get a publisher. And he sort of looked at me and he sort of said, look, he didn't do it thinking it would succeed. He, um, he did it, um, and this is something that I hadn't read before in an interview. I don't think he'd actually talked about it. Was, um, he did it because Murray was, was dying and uh, Murray he was his teacher. And uh, Murray had a lot of um, doctor's bills and he was absolutely broke. And he was, he was so upset that he would leave his family in debt. So um, the only thing Mitch thought he could do was write a story and see if he could sell it. And he only expected to get a, an advance that could cover the doctor's bills. And, of course, it covered a lot more than that. Um, but... You know, we got into a discussion about it and he said he did it because it was the right thing. And, you know, when he did the right thing, he was in an, in an authentic kind of space, I suppose, and he was doing what, something that mattered to him and the public smelt it. You know, they can smell when something is really authentic and then they bought it. They bought his story. And I think um, I saw that happen over and over again, you know. And it was happening, I interviewed him at a time when I had a lot of friends who had these amazing creative projects or had been made redundant and were wanting to sort of, you know, become a, a YouTube sensation or an overnight, you know, um, uh, eBay seller or something. You know, they, they wanted that kind of instant success that everyone thinks is happening out there. And um, Mitch and I had a bit of a chat about that. It's kind of really not how it, it works. And um, Eugene Tam being a wonderful example of it, he, he was doing the right thing. He did something that was the right thing for him and it grew and it grew and it grew because people smelt it and they bought it. Um, but Seth Godin, who's a phenomenally successful marketer, and I've got to say, of all the people I interviewed, he's absolutely the most authentic operator. He really walks his talk. He's very much his message. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Seth, um, he wrote some books. He's written over 100 books. Um, Tribes, Lynchpin, um, The Idea Virus, all these are sort of marketing terms and uh, he, he coined them. Um, he, uh, he has this theory, and I think he wrote about it in Lynchpin, um, that success and the secret to a better life is all about creating art. And by art he means anything that's a creation, anything you put out there to share with people, with humanity. Um, he calls it a gift. You give a gift. And you give it as a gift, knowing, sorry, not knowing where it will end up. Um, it's a generous act. And I love this way that he described it to me. He says it sees you lean into life, um, like an aerial skier leans to travel and grow further. And you do that 